My name is Edgar Fouché. I spent 20 years with the U.S. Air Force and another eight years as an engineering program manager for defense contractors. I was on research and development and flight operational test and evaluation for the F-15, the F-16, the A-10, the B-1, and the F-117 when they were new. I was involved in automatic test equipment, crypto, electronic countermeasures, and aircraft development. I believe that all the major aircraft companies are involved in one way or another. Lockheed, there's Lockheed Skunk Works has always been the lead as far as advanced technology. But Los Alamos, Sandia, Lawrence Livermore also support this development. As Boeing was involved in the TR-3A Manta, which is a bat wing shaped stealth vehicle that uh, originally flew out of Groom. When I was doing interviews with defense contractors and SR-71 pilots and engineers that had worked black programs, I'd trace back the development of the magnetic field disruptor as far back as 1965 with General Dynamics Convair Division. At that time, the program had been 10 years old. There were reverse engineering technology that wasn't available at that time. The difference between normal evolution of science where papers are written and pros and cons are debated on the theories and then a practical experiment is developed and once the experiment is proven, uh, practical applications of this new technology uh, is sought after usually a Department of Defense for weapons or aircraft. But in 1965, when my friend was working the magnetic field disruptor, they actually had information on what the craft would do, what it was made out of, and things like size, weight, density, but they had no papers written on it, no theories, and they were basically told, build one of these from the pieces, make it work, and explain it to us how it works. From the magnetic field disruptor, when it was tested, finally in the mid-80s at Papoose, they fired up the accelerator, and it didn't do anything. And later, looking at the test data, they found out that 89% of the weight and mass was reduced in proximity to the accelerator. So when you reverse engineer a UFO, and it only works 89% of what they think it's going to do, then the only thing you can do is hang a triangular-shaped body with advanced multi-mode rockets, one on each corner of the triangle, and fly the accelerator, which was developed from the crash saucers, around. And you only have to propel 11% of the triangle because 89% of the mass and weight is reduced. The magnetic field disruptor, which is the core of the technology in the flying triangles, was developed from reverse engineering. There was no evolution of science that produced this technology. Most from the people I talked to, the technology was anywhere from 30 to 50 years ahead of anything possible to working with gravity. Even today, the papers written on controlling gravity in one aspect or another are controversial. So to have a vehicle that actually can affect gravity by warping it, this is not anti-gravity, but it essentially warps gravity around the accelerator. Uh, the technology uh, was being worked on as far back as the mid-50s that I've been able to trace. There was and still are no papers, scientific papers, writ written supporting the theories that allow this technology to work. The flying triangle the prototype was 200 feet across. It was first flown in 1989 or 1990. The operational version of the TR-3B flying triangle is 600 feet across. The fact that it's been spotted doing 40G turns, uh, most people say, well, the pilots couldn't take 40G turns. 40 gravitational forces is enough to crush most people. However, if you compute 89% reduction of 40Gs, you basically have 4.1 G's that the pilots take because the mass and weights reduce and also the G forces and a person can take four G's comfortably. Okay. B can uh, travel at Mach 9 plus. I don't have the latest specifications but the prototype flew at Mach 9 vertically or horizontally. It could obtain suborbital sub orbit it could obtain suborbital altitudes. It is essentially a long order time surveillance and reconnaissance craft. The minimum crew of the TR-3B is four. I don't know what the maximum capacity is. 
The flying wings were first flown in the U.S. in 1948, and they were essentially built by Northrop. Uh, there were circular wing aircraft, or saucers, being prototyped and tested uh, by the Nazis in World War II. Some of their science and technology and scientists were brought over to the United States. Uh, for example, A.V. Rowe or Avro had a contract with the Department of Defense and built several prototypes of the flying saucer in Canada. Uh, they had told uh, citizens for years that after the first Avro car did not meet specifications, the program was canceled. Recent Freedom of Information Act releases have showed that many versions of the Avro saucer were built and tested and flown out of Groom Lake in the 60s. The Department of Defense strives on secrecy. There is more money going into black technology than ever, ever before. There's less world threats, so you would think that the defense technology, the defense budgets would be reduced, but in, in essence, we're spending more now on black programs than we ever have. The most fascinating top secret facility that I know of is the, the Defense Advanced Research Center which is called DARK, which is based at Papoose Lake, south of Groom Lake in Area 51, is a facility that goes 10 stories underground and has a massive amount of floor space. The hangars for the TR-3B Flying Triangle and TR-3A Flying Batwing Manta are housed and serviced because the depot is at Papoose. Essentially, the aircraft can be parked in hangars built in the sides of hills, the hangars have floors much like carrier decks to where the aircraft can be taken down at many levels below to be serviced and maintained. That's where the logistics support is for these black aircraft. When I was assigned to Nellis Air Force Base in the late 70s, I worked electronic countermeasures. I was certified on certain crypto equipment. All cryptological equipment in the U.S. is controlled by the National Security Agency. Had a top secret queue and crypto access clearances. Uh, I was assigned to Groom Lake Air Base for two weeks temporary to repair some crypto equipment that uh, was being maintained by a person that was permanently assigned there but had to go on emergency leave. One of the first things that I noticed that was unusual for my experiences was you have to wear these very myopic, uh, they almost look like welder's glasses. They have thick polarized lenses. There's no peripheral vision. Anything beyond 30 feet is totally blurred. You have to wear these. Part of the briefing the security people give you is anytime you're outside a hangar, you have to wear those. If you're not permanently assigned there, you have to be escorted. And all the escorts are armed escorts. So you always remember what causes you discomfort. A couple of friends of mine that flew the SR-71 and other prototype advanced vehicles at Groom all complained about having to wear the glasses. Uh, and it fascinates me that all these people that supposedly have worked at Groom Air Base have never mentioned these uncomfortable glasses you have to wear. Stealth and reconnaissance aircraft are essentially uh, developed by the Air Force and the Navy. The reconnaissance aircraft such as the SR-71, the SR-75 that replaced it, the TR-3A flying batwing or Manta, the TR-3B Flying Triangle, or ASTRA, are funded, joint funded by the National Reconnaissance Office, the National Security Agency, the CIA, and the U.S. Air Force. The U.S. Air Force has operational control of the vehicles and the pilots. The missions are coordinated amongst the agencies that provided the black funding for these programs. They're primarily reconnaissance and intelligence-oriented aircraft. Every military agency is involved in recovering crashed aircrafts, where it's, whether it's foreign technology, such as foreign countries, or alien artifacts uh, that are recovered. But primarily in 1947, when the Air Force was established, they became the primary operational control of all alien artifacts. The Defense Advanced Research Center at Papoose, which is primarily manned by the Air Force and the Navy, the National Reconnaissance Office, the CIA, and the National Security Agency, controls all research, development, logistics, and control of crashed alien artifacts. I have personally not a lot of information on actual aliens with the crashed vehicles. I was sent two documents by a friend of mine 
whose father had worked at the National Security Agency almost 30 years. He was one of the five people that put me in contact with his contacts while I was developing the book Alien Rapture. These two documents, one was the new revised charter during the Reagan administration, which says on the cover page that it's signed by proxy, which leads me to believe, and I was told, that the presidents haven't been involved since Truman. The second document we obtained was the autopsy report, attachment D, to the Eisenhower report. Now, the names and dates were left off these documents, but uh, what leads me to believe that they are accurate is it talks about the removable lenses of the aliens before Corso, Colonel Corso had a manuscript, long before Santilli ever had the alien autopsy film, talks about a geo-organ, which is pictured in the alien autopsy, but nobody ever uh, brings attention to it. Uh, from the people I've talked to on the inside, the alien autopsy was made from disinformation. It was funded by the government. It is 90% accurate. But as we all know, nobody's running across six-fingered aliens. The geo-organ, when you look at the uh, autopsy that was shown on TV, is essentially one round, flattish organ in the center of the abdomen of the alien. Uh, if you were to design or genetically engineer a being, uh, you probably wouldn't have a bunch of different organs that function separately on their own. You would integrate the bioorganisms into one. I talked to several judge advocate general lawyers and publishing lawyers before I allowed the manuscript to be read by anybody besides Brad Steiger. Essentially, I cannot talk about any programs I work directly on, the technology, the people assigned to it, or any other information involved with those programs. However, there's nothing against the Secrets Acts or the law to talk about secondhand information you get from people that you've known 20 or 30 years that you trust with your life. The information I talk about publicly is all secondhand information from people I've known 20 or 30 years. Essentially, uh, when you sign certain Secrets Acts, you cannot speak about it for 30 years or more. In some cases, what you sign says you can never speak about it unless you are authorized to. I believe eventually there's always a trickle-down trickle effect from black technology to commercial technology. The problem that most people have is that we spend billions of dollars on black technology and we keep it secret until every other country in the world discovers this technology, puts it out commercially, and then we're behind, essentially putting our own commerce uh, secondary to other countries. We have energy technology and transportation technologies that could revolutionize and make the world better as we sit here, but it's being kept secret. Eventually, the Germans, the French, the Japanese will put out technology that they learn from us, or reverse engineer, or create on their own that we could have a lead in. Essentially, people that have worked in the military or within the Department of Defense. Most people have pensions or retirements or benefits that they wish to protect. They have families they wish to protect. Uh, a lot of people are running around saying that they work top secret programs and are talking about them in detail. Um, I have a hard time believing that because I interviewed over 40 people that had worked with, within the Department of Defense, the National Security Agency, had worked black development programs. I knew this personally. They would never talk to the media. They were quite nervous to even talk to me. I couldn't even use my cassette recorder to record them or take notes. They were willing to talk to me one-on-one -on -one with the promise that I would not reveal their names. Uh, but these people, some are afraid for their physical safety or their families. Others are only worried about their retirement pensions and benefits. It's different for different people. Some people that uh, I was put in contact with trusted me, but they wouldn't talk to me at all because of what they felt was patriotism. From what I know from interviewing people and uh, experiences that I've had, we have no functional flying saucers that meet the requirements for re neither reconnaissance nor strategic missions. The problem with the flying saucers is they use a form of propulsion that we haven't perfected. When we perfected the magnetic field disruptor, which is essentially a reverse engineered UFO propulsion system, it only worked 89% as effective as it should. At 100%, it would have been able to repel gravity and you could use it as a propulsive force. 
But when you only have something that works 89 percent, that, re that reduces mass and weight and g-forces by 89 percent, the only option you have to take advantage of this technology in an aerospace vehicle is to hang a triangular body on it, put three multi-mode engines on it, and fly this propulsion system around. I keep hearing stories of different vehicles that we use. Uh, we have something called a sun sieve that stays in orbit. It services National Reconnaissance Office and National Security Agency satellites. Uh, the new satellites are built to be serviced by robotic vehicles. Uh, the Sun sieve was essentially orbited uh, from the back of the SR-75, which replaced the SR-71. When the SR-75 gets up to 110,000 feet altitude, it launches the SCRAMP SR-74 for suborbital missions, or it can launch the Sun sieve, which stays in permanent orbit to repair these craft. And so, uh, reportedly, both the SR-74 SCRAMP, which is manned, and the Sun sieve, which is a robotic vehicle, uh, can attain orbit and uh, potentially go to the moon. I hear stories about vehicles that have been going to the moon for 10 years, but I have not enough information to, to believe uh, that it's actually going on. I believe that all forms of 75 swept wing aircraft, delta-shaped aircraft, lifting bodies, and triangular-shaped vehicles belong to the U.S. government or some other earthly government. I believe that all these <coughs> triangular and uh, swept wing configurations, uh, the latest ones were developed from reverse engineering technology. So it would lead me to believe that all circular or tubular vehicles uh, belong to some sentient race not from the Earth. I was told by two friends of mine that are essentially sources, as you'd call them, that the TR-3B, the operational version, which is 600 feet across, caused the Phoenix light. The effect was caused by holographic generators that I don't have a lot of details of the technology. I'm getting pieces. And essentially, they use some type of beam, uh, focusing beam, to agitate or resonate uh, molecules of the air such as nitrogen and oxygen and then at that point same point they're using lasers to create a three-dimensional object on this agitated field at this point they can only generate balls of light usually they're orange or red uh, or some blue so if you take a crap like the PR3B that has electrochromatic coating they can change colors reflectiveness and radar absorptiveness. It can cloak itself, it could look like the sky. Uh, most of the triangles are only spotted from the bottom uh, at night where people have taken pictures of silhouettes because it has this ability to change uh, its configuration such as color uh, or patterns such as a star field or a cloud field. So if the TR-3B, which I believe it was, was over Phoenix and generating these holographic balls of light, all you would see were the lights and not the vehicle. I believe eventually all technology comes forward, but we have two problems now. One is the government doesn't want to admit how many billions of dollars they're putting into black programs. And two, some of the technology is so extraordinary and connected back as far back as the Roswell crash and other crashes. Uh, alien vehicles that we've reverse engineered. I'm not sure if the information will be forthright unless one crashes and CNN happens to show up and film it before it's carted off. The flying bat wing configurations or flying wings that are uh, such as the TR-3A and the flying triangles are essentially tactical reconnaissance vehicles. Uh, I know nothing of the weapon systems. There are other vehicles such as the replacement for the F-111 swing wing bomber uh, that have been called several different names that are fighters and bombers that are armed with weapons. I've essentially concentrated on the technology involved with the flying triangles. During the development of my book, I essentially started off with five of my closest friends who had worked in the Department of Defense and the Air Force for 20 to 30 years. Most of them I'd known since the Vietnam conflict. We decided to write the book trying to detail the rever how the reverse engineering of technology brought forth such vehicles as the TR-3B. 
we made a pact that they would put me in contact with their closest friends and that I would go personally, face-to-face, -face, talk to them because they would not talk to me over the phone or send me information. During this process, I tried in every case to only use information in the book and my presentation that I had at least two sources of accurate information. I heard wild stories at time from people I really respected and trusted, but we did not develop this information uh, if we didn't have more than one source. I applaud uh, everybody's effort to bring out more information to the government and make the government more open uh, with talking about crashed vehicles and advanced technology. Uh, but as far as getting on somebody's list uh, to talk about this technology or my own personal experiences, uh, I feel like until the list is developed and people start talking without any harm coming to them, I'll sit back and wait. I believe that the Germans and the Japanese have technology that is close to what we developed in the early 1990s and that you will see more uh, odd-shaped vehicles flying around. I heard in 1994 that the TR-3B prototype, which is 200 feet across, was being used by the Navy and that the Navy was actually retrofitting a carrier to where this thing could land on a carrier and be taken below deck for repairs and to be out of observation uh, from planes or people that pass by. To my knowledge, the largest vehicle flying is the 600 feet operational model of the TR-3B. However, the holographic generators on the TR-3A and the TR-3B can project images out to two miles. I think uh, the goal for holographic generators is to essentially be able to project any type image they want. I believe the state of the technology is to where they can only project geometric uh, objects. But uh, you can only imagine what uh, a vehicle would be like if you could project a giant uh, monster in front of troops that was roaring that looked lifelike, uh, or if a godlike figure appeared on a cloud and told the enemy to surrender, there's any number of, is only limited by your imagination. I believe that the Foo Fighters were essentially some type of alien or sentient controlled objects. The holographic generators are developed through the normal progression of laser and holographic technology. Alien Rapture, The Chosen by Edgar Fouché, myself, and Brad Steiger. It's available on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, through Galdi Press at 1-800-777-3454, or through our webpage, FouchéMedia.com, F-O-U-C-H-E-M-E-D-I-A.com. These are pictures of the flying triangle taken in 1969 in Romania, 1967 in Bulgaria. The top two were taken in Belgium in 1989 and 90. You can see the exhaust from the three multi-mode rocket engines on the top two pictures. These pictures have been greatly enhanced or the not very good quality. The pictures, actual photographs. Yes, actual photographs. The top picture of the flying triangle is the TR-3B, which has three multi-mode nuclear rocket engines on each corner, which you can see while it's in flight. This is a computer-enhanced composite picture generated by a computer based on all the specifications of known triangular vehicles. This is a schematic representation of the TR-3B from the top view, the bottom view, and the side view. Some people see in the side view has described this as cigar shaped or tubular shaped. This is a picture of the B-2 bomber. It's actually a model. Uh, the picture is developed by the Air Force Recruiting Service. This is a color picture of the YB-49 flying wing taken in 1948. I got this from an Air Force person. A lot of people have mistaken the F-117 stealth fighter as a UFO. You can see from this direction of the aircraft at night, it does look like a UFO. This is a picture 
of the prototype TR-3B Flying Triangle Astra. It's 200 feet across, carries a crew of four. This is the operational version of the TR-3B Flying Triangle. It's 600 feet across, uses three multi-mode rocket engines, one mounted on each corner underneath for propulsion. This is a picture of TR-3B Flying Triangle, which is 600 feet across. It uses a magnetic field disruptor that disrupts gravity and reduces mass and weight by 89% and also reduces the G-forces of pilot's field. This is an F-15 pilot flying an F-15 aircraft. The canopy in this picture is, appears to be invisible, but it's just made out of a material uh, that uh, looks perfectly clear. My name is Stephen Bassett, and I'm the founder of the Paradigm Research Group, uh, which is an uh, organization created to support the research effort to support the political initiatives and to work with researchers and activists in the field. It was, it was started in 1996. I'm also the author of the Paradigm Clock website, which is designed to do the same. Uh, the uh, principal uh, uh, direction of my work is, is one of, of uh, forcing political initiatives at the government designed to get a specific result. And that result is fairly unambiguous, namely uh, disclosure in a formal way by the United States government that we have an extraterrestrial presence. Beyond that, we'll see what happens. There's a complex relationship between, I think, the particularly the more long-term people in the field uh, and the politics. By and large, this has been a science-driven process, uh, uh, discovery, uh, proof, information, the politics has not really been a significant uh, aspect of it. And, and so there's a, there's a misunderstanding, there's some un uncertainty, and there's a certain amount of cynicism about it. Uh, the, there's a lot of distrust of the government within this field, appropriately so, and there's uncertainties whether any kind of, any kind of government-based political action could result in a conclusive outcome. I don't blame them for that. It's appropriate, but the fact is that, that the very reason there's politics now is that all of this work is accumulating. It's piling up on itself. The awareness level in the United States goes up, and that includes the awareness level not only of citizens, but also the awareness level of, of politicians, their staff, uh, uh, and agency personnel. And the net result is, is that, and this is true of, of, of in history at many times, same thing with the perfect analogy is the anti-war movement. The anti-war movement starts as a rather radical fringe thing that's going against some uh, very sacred uh, issues that people hold uh, and is discounted out of hand and then slowly builds and builds and builds until finally it is such size and, and uh, such scope and there's enough people involved that it politicizes. And it politicized enough that it brought down a president, changed uh, uh, a number of laws, and ultimately forced the end to the war in a way which uh, would have been quite different. So the same thing with the UFO movement, if you want to call it that. It is now large enough, there are enough people involved, that it must become political. Why? Well, you wouldn't need to be political if all that was issue is knowing or not knowing. We have saucers, we don't have saucers. We have ETs, we don't have ETs, and that's it. We know, we don't know, and that's all that's going to happen. Politics is not important. The reason there has to be politics is that it's now quite clear that not only are there historical issues, but there are a huge range of future issues in which the reality of the extraterrestrial presence and our decisions as a, as a, uh, uh, as a, as a republic and as a, a citizenry are going to become intertwined and that we're going to make decisions in the future which this is going to affect, and those decisions could be monumental. I had the special uh, good fortune of coming into the field three years ago and needing to find a niche, and lo and behold, for whatever reason, who knows why, uh, no one had, had, had decided, gee, there's, there isn't a, a person acting as a formal lobbyist for the field, for the, for the issues. It wouldn't exist. And as it happened, I, I, I've lived in and out of Washington, been in and out of Washington for, for decades. I know, that, know the area quite well. My f members of my family have lived here for 60 years. So I knew that I could operate here comfortably. 
so it was not a hard decision to go, okay, what I'm going to do, and this is after spending four months up at Pier in, uh, in Cambridge, John Mack Center, that uh, is dealing with some complex issues there. I worked there as a volunteer. Uh, I came down to Washington and opened up uh, a, a home office with the intent of being a lobbying operation. And I was the first to do so for no other reason than no one else had. But the reason no one else had was that, uh, again, the politicization of this whole phenomena has just really started to happen in a major way in the last six years. There's obviously no money for that work that has to be done pro bono, uh, and it's still highly uh, subject to ridicule and, uh, and uh, 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 being dismissed. So it's not, it's not an obvious choice for someone that, quote, wants to do lobbying. So uh, I was able to, to make that move in 96 and overall have had a relatively good experience in that time with, with m much more upside than downside in terms of dealing with media and, and political and agency people. At this point, I've, I, have, I have formal arrangements with six, six groups. Um, I am a registered lobbyist for CSETI, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, for the Enterprise Mission, for Operation Right to Know, and for Skywatch International. Um, I consult the cause, I'm not a registered lobbyist for them, and I consult to the Microsoft Network UFO Forum. Um, all of these groups have fundamentally one thing in common, all of these, these entities. They pretty much are committed to the process of disclosure. They, they expect the government to come forward and disclose this issue. They feel it's appropriate and they want it to happen. Uh, there's differences of opinion about evidence, there's differences of opinion about strategy, but overall they have that desire. And, uh, and in my opinion, they have made significant contributions to the field in one way or another. And for that reason, I work on their behalf and support them in, in a number of ways on a pro bono basis. And uh, we'll do whatever they would like me to do. And whenever I've uh, got something going, I make sure they're involved and give them an opportunity to participate. Uh, there are many other people in the field that I admire and support. Uh, we could name names for, for 20 minutes. But by and large, I am going to work with and attract the individuals that are not uncomfortable about going political with this issue, about getting down where the rubber meets the road and, and sticking this issue right under the nose of the President, the House, the Senate, appropriate government agencies, and the political press. One of the advantages of being in Washington is that you get to deal with the, a concentrated group of political press. There's obviously a lot of journalists. There's thousands of journalists. I'm interested in the political journalists. These are the ones that cover those issues. And when they decide to cover them, they become part of the political process. A lot of people don't realize that to the extent that politics and media and news have merged together in the last 15 years, if you were to get a list of all the people who have been in, in, in direct political positions and have gone into the media as political journalists or commentators, or have been a speechwriter, or have been in entertainment industry and gone to news, or in all three, it is in fact a very, very long list. And so you, if you want to deal with consciousness raising uh, on any subject matter, the idea that you just go to the media or you go to, the, to, to, to Congress is, is not sufficient. You have to go to all uh, of these, uh, these areas simultaneously. Uh, and the way things are now is that, increasingly, political action in Washington is driven by the political press. In other words, they seize on something, they start to elevate it, they start to ask the questions, and the politicians respond. It has long since uh, been the other way, where the politicians do their thing and the press just follows them around and takes notes. Well, the public is going to get involved in these ways. One. Uh, increasingly, and increasing numbers of them are going to be accessing the internet and they're going to be accessing websites that have information about the science and the politics of the UFO question. That's, without, that's a given. Uh, they're, they're also getting involved by uh, the talk radio. Millions and millions of citizens are listening to talk radio and starting to formulate opinions about this. Uh, out of that, there are a number, beyond that, there are a number of initiatives that they can directly get involved with. Uh, the most important one, in my opinion, is the a congressional petition drive. There, there is a, an open congressional hearing petition calling for Congress to permit government employees, former and current, to go before the Congress in an open hearing to discuss their personal experiences with both evidence and events directly implicating the, uh, the extraterrestrial issue. Um, there is a paper petition on the Paradigm Research Group website, Paradigm Clock, 
that the paper petition can be downloaded from a number of other sites, including uh, Stargate International and Anagram Video and several others. There's also an electronic petition at the Paradigm Research Group site uh, that allows people to simply submit their name directly. Uh, the American people can make their opinion very succinctly known by filling out those petitions to the point where we have somewhere in the range of a half million to a million. When we have that kind of number, we're going to create a very, very formal press event and we're going to present those signatures with all the bells and whistles to representatives of the House and uh, Senate leadership. Uh, so that's a completely inexpensive, trivial way for citizens to directly impact the issue. There is going to be a, 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 an effort to put specific language regarding the congressional hearings on the state ballots as propositions or, call, or ballot initiatives in the 2000 election. This, this, this process is underway. Uh, MUFON, the largest and uh, best known uh, UFO organizations in the country, has been approached formally to back it with uh, their, uh, their membership. I hope that MUFON makes the decision to do that. Uh, that ballot initiative will be in some key states, including Arizona and California. People can get involved there. Uh, they can also get involved by emailing and faxing their representatives at the Senate and Congress uh, and the key news people that they work with or know about in their state, as well as national news, regarding the lack of in-depth coverage on the UFO question, particularly the, uh, the, uh, the government posture on it and the cover-up. Uh, that is an easy thing to do, and, 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 and those faxes and emails do count. As a matter of fact, uh, before the scandal on President Clinton broke, we uh, knew that a number of uh, members of congressional committees had gotten so many faxes and emails during that uh, end of 97 period that they were actually discussing the issue of hearings in caucus rooms uh, and uh, in the hallways on the Capitol. Uh, that was all shut down with the beginning of the scandal. That impeachment process is now over, and we expect uh, uh, them to go back to work, and we expect to see these faxes turning up again in emails. So. The problem here is that the United States is in such a preeminent position, both politically and militarily in the, in the world now, and every country out there, except for a, a few, have such significant political and, and, and economic ties to us that there is enormous disincentive for a, na for a nation to, quote, out that issue. In other words, what is the upside for a Belgium or a Brazil to suddenly decide that it is going to press the political initiative and try to, quote, create its own formal disclosure process through its own government? Uh, the upside is probably a lot of ridicule and, and bizarre press. The downside is suddenly uh, economic relationships take a turn and go, go south. Uh, I believe the rest of the world sees this as the United States's uh, a decision to, to make. It's our call. And what will happen is that once the United States government discloses on this, quite a few other governments in, around the world are going to quickly step forward and say something along the lines of, well, you know, we actually had a pretty strong sense of this, too. We have our own inside information on this. And we, we second that disclosure. We confirm that disclosure. And we certainly look forward to working with the United States to, uh, to address the issue both theoretically, philosophically, and politically. The, there, there, there is, I, I believe within the United States government there is a conflict, there is a, a debate amongst certain elements and groups that are attuned to this about whether to disclose or not. There's some indications that they were ramping the process up at the end of the Bush administration for disclosure in the first year of the Bush administration. And I could spend a lot of time saying why that is. Uh, but from their point of view, it would have been a highly favorable arena to do it. The election of Clinton completely threw any such plans up in the air. But overall, there is, in fact, a debate, so that they're weighing it one against the other. Uh, and, and, and it's a standoff at this point, in my opinion. In other words, it's a standoff. The two ideas, uh, formally disclose, continue to, to sit tight, are, are in standoff. Uh, neither group has the upper hand. Uh, and we need the American people to break the tie. Uh, that it, it is. It is the opinion of, of myself and the people that I uh, work with and support that it is in the interest of the nation and the people to disclose. If we didn't think that, then obviously pursuing this would be a little bit uh, disingenuous as well as not in the national interest. Uh, the reasons why that is are very complex and we need a much longer interview to get into. But the upshot is simply that now more damage is being done by this intense secrecy in general 
and certainly the secrecy regarding this specific issue, then good is being created. Uh, and as a result, just as you have with a, uh, you know, a very, very, you know, a boil, you know, if it gets large enough and, and painful enough, uh, at some point the, uh, the decision has to be made to, to lance it. This is a boil that needs to be lanced. There is a whole lot of neat things that will happen uh, worldwide, and certainly in America, when we do, and I believe that the good will outweigh the bad. If I am wrong, I will be happy to publicly apologize, as I'm sure all my uh, associates would, and we'll say, gee, sorry, we didn't think it was going to be this way. But that's the nature of governance. That's the nature of being a free nation, uh, not having everything delivered to you on a silver platter, and not o only making decisions when you absolutely know the outcome. You have to take chances and act, what you, you and act in a manner you consider in the best interest of the public. Obviously, there are people who disagree. We, uh, we think that uh, eventually they will be persuaded. Uh, by the way, I left out one organization when I was listing the groups that I represent, and that's Stargate International, uh, which in fact was the source of the congressional hearing petition, and then it was written at uh, their headquarters uh, in just before the July uh, gathering in, in Roswell in 1997. Um, and they are still the, quote, parent of that petition, though, which has become uh, part of the larger community and, is, and is, represents the larger community. And the petitions are still gathered in an address related to Stargate International in Tucson, and that's going to remain the case. Uh, the other electronic petitions are gathered by me in Washington. Uh, Stargate International is, is sort of in suspended operations now, uh, but, uh, and where that organization is going is, is unknown at this point. Nevertheless, it remains the parent of the petition and uh, will continue to be associated with that petition as it moves forward. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, 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 having uh, the members of Stargate International, uh, past and present, be, be on the steps of the, the, the Senate when, uh, when those petitions are presented. I sometimes ask, uh, why not take a more deus ex machina approach to this, namely simply go about our lives and permit the extraterrestrials to make the call? Uh, obviously, if they want formal uh, disclosure, they could have it any time if they desired. Um, this is an issue that I've thought about, uh, but there's a fairly straightforward response to it. One, I'm not comfortable with making decisions uh, about my life, uh, about the nation's life, uh, and about our global environment based upon the actions of others outside of our reality. We can't control what they do, and therefore I think we need to operate in our best interest, and they will do what they will. The second point that needs to be made is that A very reasonable interpretation of the events that have transpired since 1947 is a ramping process uh, in which a number of things are going on simultaneously, not the least of which is that the awareness level of the, of the people of this planet is being significantly altered and raised on this question. And in the last six years, clearly there's been a sea change in the types of sightings, the, uh, the uh, frequency of sightings, the quality of sightings. It's not inconceivable, and I think this is a reasonable position to take, that these entities are forcing the action indirectly, and the question would be why. And it's really not a complicated question. There is a world of difference between a species of sentient animals, such as ourselves, having this particular paradigm crammed down their throat by some Independence Day reality or formal injection by these, by extraterrestrials, as opposed to our global societies educating ourselves to the issue, politically engaging it, and then openly acknowledging it to ourselves, formally disclosing it to ourselves, and then dealing with the issue as we see fit. One is completely disempowering, and one is very empowering. It is not unreasonable to think that these entities have, do not fundamentally want to overly disrupt uh, any more than they already are and disempower our cultures, particularly at a time when we're obviously quite unstable. It could cause a lot of havoc, uh, havoc and damage. And so, frankly, I see them forcing it indirectly, waiting for us to do our job. And I wouldn't be surprised, and I have no trouble making this statement, that once we do disclose, contact is going to follow rather remarkably soon. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. The religious issue is raised
quite often, you know, and it's funny, I, I will say this, I have not really encountered much of a problem there at all. I have talked with people from time to time who have very strong religious views. I happen to know that uh, within the field itself, we have plenty of very religious people that are working in research, working in, uh, in media and the UFO question. Uh, there have been an occasional blip on the screen. I think uh, not too long ago, Pat Robertson made a comment uh, that uh, there was some sort of satanting relationship between uh, the issue. But overall, uh, the religious institutions and followers of religion in this country have really not had much to say about it, nor have they shown significant discomfort about it. The primary discomfort comes from the media and the politicians, way above the levels that you see from religion. And I have a very gut feeling that religion is going to be remarkably adaptive to this, that they're going to take it in stride and uh, be less, perhaps, upset by it than your average uh, run-of-the-mill atheist. Uh, other culture, as you move out of the country and you get into the complex world situations, certainly. The fact is, is that everything that humans have ever done, every major uh, move that we've ever made, every significant change in worldviews has always disrupted cultures. There's nothing new here. Uh, the fact is, is that generally the damage is done not because change comes, but because it's not addressed. It's, 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 it's coveted, meaning it's kept tight amongst a very uh, a cliquish power group that then wield all kinds of havoc and damage. Uh, or it's twisted, it's subverted, it's disinformation. That's where the damage comes. Generally, the human race has done quite well when it confronts new and unusual uh, changes in its, in its history uh, and moves forward. Uh, so, in fact, in my opinion, the non-disclosure process, whatever benefits it, it provided, particularly during the Cold War, uh, overall is seen it's, it's, it's run its course and that further uh, attempts to uh, suppress this issue is going to start doing the same kind of damage that has occurred over the last 5,000 years whenever global cultures and global religions and, and nations and empires have confronted extreme change uh, get on top of it make it your own uh, engage it politicize it and you will master it and everything will be just fine and any 17 year old kid can tell you this People want to know what 17-year-olds think about this. Go talk to John Greenwald, the publisher of the Black Vault on the Internet. This, this guy is wiser and more astute than 90% of the entire uh, political management in Washington, D.C. And one of the reasons he's that way is because he's young, and he hasn't been influenced by uh, both the historical and educational realities that we grew up with. Uh, times are changing, and uh, the issue really is whether our generation and uh, the generation behind me, which really goes back to World War II, is going to get involved in this, or we're going to be sticking the muds, muds, and uh, and let this thing uh, 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 really dawdle unnecessarily. For those individuals who who are interested in the political aspects of this, and the more activist aspects, obviously they can go to the websites of all the groups that that I that I work with. Uh, rather than give those out, I'll simply say if you go to the Paradigm Clock website, which is www.paradigmclock.com, and that's P-A-R-D-I-G-M, not D-I-M-E. Uh, you'll find links to all of the organizations that I'm working with, uh, as well as a full section on the politics of UFOs, uh, including the initiatives for, ba uh, for the ballot uh, wording, for the congressional hearing, uh, direct petitioning, lobbying, all of these things well covered there. Also, the Paradigm Clock has two other things which I'm quite proud of, one of which is it has the largest online bibliography, reference bibliography for the field in the world. 23, 2,500 authored references there, both alphabetically by author and by category, breaking them up in the various aspects of the field that they, they focus on. The largest bibliography in the world is, is about 6,000 references amassed by Jerome Clark and recently published in his UFO Encyclopedia. That's a pretty sizable reference bibliography, by the way, for those people who think this is all thin and, and illusory. Uh, and the other thing, maybe more important, is the Paradigm Clock website has a Paradigm Clock and this is a very intentional device. It is a metaphor, exactly analogous to the Doomsday Clock, which was published initially in 1947 by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. That clock tracked how close we were, midnight, to nuclear war. Midnight, the game is up. And they, they were able to use that metaphor to educate the public and the media about the fact that there is a relationship between building hydrogen bombs and atomic bombs and missiles and planes and having confrontational politics 
and a result, namely nuclear war, everybody dies, game over. Midnight was the metaphor. And the paradigm clock, midnight represents something else, something a little less sinister. Midnight on the paradigm clock means that formal dis the, pre the formal acknowledgement by our government of the extraterrestrial presence has occurred, or that the top papers in the nation, New York Times, Washington uh, Post, LA Times, have acknowledged that presence in, in, uh, in, in consensus editorials in those papers, which would have roughly the same result. When that happens, we strike midnight. That's what the paradigm clock tracks. It was published initially in, um, on April 30th of 1998, and it was set at uh, three minutes to midnight. However, in order to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to parallel it with the, 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 uh, the uh, doomsday clock, I, it was retroactively published in the same year, 1947, as the doomsday clock, and set at the same time, I believe seven minutes to midnight, and then it was changed over these intervening years retroactively, and that is all chronicled on the website. You can see some of the things that occurred and how they moved the clock forward and how they moved it back. And then it was formally published on April 30th at three minutes to midnight. It's been changed once since then. It is now three minutes and 30 seconds to midnight because of some events that took place last year, not the least of which the death of Philip Corso before he was really fully engaged by the mainstream media and before he could appear in congressional hearings. There were some other things that set us back a little bit. So the paradigm clock is there. Uh, as far as contacting the paradigm research group, all the contact information is on that website, but for those without computers, they can uh, reach uh, uh, PRG at paradigmrg at aol.com, or they can call 301-564-1820. Uh, the website for the Paradigm Clock, the official website of the Paradigm Research Group, is www.paradigmclock.com. And the email address is paradigmrg at aol.com. Well, uh, about two months after TWA Flight 800 uh, went down, I was contacted by...